Chuck can test it. Okay. All right. Well, I made this slide, but unfortunately, if you're watching it on video, you won't see all of it because I didn't think about. I didn't think that through. Uh, but you can see it all here live. So, uh, kind of putting together what we talked about the other day about definitions. I kind of got to thinking about how I wrote it out. It was like there really should be like more of a hierarchy. And so we, uh, one of our things was an indication. Like we had definitions, we put indication. Oh, hi. Yep. <laughs> taking pictures of me. Uh, indication. No, I want a picture. Well, this is indications. And then we had interpretation. And you can see this box right here represents interpretation. So we follow the flow chart. We get an indication. <clears throat> is the indication false indication? And did we define a false indication? Yes, an indication that it is interpreted to be caused by a condition other than discontinuity. Like what? A fingerprint. So is it a false indication? Uh, it's a, is it a fingerprint? No, it is not. Well, then is it non-relevant? What is non-relevant? Scrap. Yeah. Indication caused by a condition or type of discontinuity that is non-rejectable, like a, not meaning you don't need to reject it. A it's supposed to be there, a lapseem, something like that, something in the, the process where you're going to get some sort of discontinuity type of thing. So, um, is it non-relevant? Uh, yes, it is. Well, it's, if it's false or if it's non-relevant, that's going to bring us down here. If it's uh, not non-relevant, and then it becomes irrelevant because that's the only thing that's left. And so, after relevant, then we're going to go into evaluation, um, which is does it violate the acceptance criteria? Which might be cracks in this area are cause for rejection, or maybe it's cracks less than this size are acceptable or cracks in this area are acceptable so we would do as a violate acceptance criteria well if it does reject it and then would accept back over to here if we have a false or non-relevant then we just decide does it interfere with the inspection in other words you know some of you that are doing this especially with the liquid penetrant did it bleed out in an area that now prevents you from inspecting that area do you have a hole that was drilled in a part and you didn't wash out that hole very well now it bled from the hole and looks like um, cracks are covering up an area. Well, if it does, then you got to reprocess. What does reprocess mean? <coughs> you start at the beginning. You wash the whole thing. You redo the whole process. Um, if not, then it's gone. So anyway, I put that together. That's what I did on my break. What did you guys do? Ate dinner. Oh, just sort of fancy dinner. <laughs> what it did. <laughs> Like All right, and then we started to talk about liquid penetrant inspection, and we got that far. Liquid penetrant inspection. Then we quit. So, liquid penetrant inspection. It is a non destructive testing method for locating. So, NDT method for locating. What type of discontinuity? Surface uh, level discontinuities. Surface discontinuities. It's going to write cracks at the same time. See world. Uh, in other words, the crack must be on the surface. On open to the surface, not just on the surface, open to the surface. This one was just barely subsurface. <coughs> it would not work. So. In other words, crack must be open to the surface. All right, so our basic operating principle for penetrant inspection. All right, first step. We want to do a non-destructive testing liquid penetrant. And there's many different types. We know that the discontinuity, because I hate to say crack, because it could be something other than that, a blowhole pipe and various other things, but something we don't want, uh, well, you can say crack, open to the surface. So the very first thing we were going to do with this part that we want to inspect is clean. 
And I believe uh, somewhere in here I'm going to talk about all the cleaning methods. We'll go into that in a little bit more detail. But we have to clean it in such a way that does not damage the part and allows it to be tested. Then we, so the part is cleaned, dried, ready to go. Next step is? Apply penetrant. And we will talk about many different types of penetrant, the methods for applying it, what makes it penetrant, what doesn't. If we go back in history, uh, I believe this process was started with just <coughs> used oil. You would clean a part, put the part in some used oil, take it out of this oil bath, let it soak into the crack, wipe it all clean, and then wherever there was a discontinuity, a crack, the oil would seep back out. And to help find it, they would put like talc powder over it, make it white, and it would kind of blot itself out. But we are going to apply a penetrant to the part. Like I said, we'll talk more about the methods. You can brush it, dip it, spray it, soak pour it. it. So, that was dip. That was dip. Okay. Dip, brush, soak, pour. Uh, all right. Um, <clears throat> then what? Come on. Uh, no. Nope. Yes, penetrant is allowed uh, to sit on the part. Sit on the part. That is called dwell. Anytime we just wait, it's dwell time. Dwell. It's going to dwell. And penetrant is allowed to sit on the part, dwell, uh, which allows it to, well, and seeps into the part. <coughs> seeps into the part. <clears throat> All right, so we've uh, sat there and we've waited for a while. We let the penetrant seep into the part. What's my next step? Wash it off. Clean the penetrant. Clean the penetrant. That's the right idea. Penetrant is removed. <clears throat> penetrant is removed from the part but not the discontinuity. That's the key factor. We remove it from the parts that are the part of the part that is good. And hopefully, as we wipe, clean, wash, whatever, we've cleaned the entire part, but our dye that we're looking for is still stuck in the crack. And then it's gonna seep its way back out. And we'll say, aha, that was clean a second ago, but now there's more penetrant. Where's it coming from? It's coming from a? Discontinuity. Discontinuity, uh, then technically speaking. Uh, after the penetrant is removed, we apply some sort of developer, which really, honestly, is not necessary. I mean, it is for the, the process, the real process, but you can actually find a part cracked quite easily without developer and call it. You go, that is cracked. You don't need developer to call something cracked. Uh, developer, then part is inspected. inspected and indications are evaluated so at any point during this process you can say that is cracked sure you see it yep but you can't say that is good right until the whole thing is done and dealt with exactly so you have to use developer to call it dead yes Shouldn't there be a dwell time on the developer as well? Yes. I mean. But this is the basic. <coughs> okay. So, this one very basic on it. Um, let's see. The penetrants we used. Um, of course, we can't just, you know, make up something. Go, well, uh, Kevin said something about used oil, so got a cord over here. Uh, a good penetrant. We're going to buy our penetrants, but a good penetrant must have five qualities. <clears throat> and like I said, you buy the penetrant. <clears throat> You're going to buy it according to its sensitivity level. We'll get into that. But these are the things, one, no, that make it a good penetrant. <clears throat> one, it must have a high wetting ability. And not like my dog, who has a high wetting ability. It means it has a low contact angle. <clears throat> I 
So if you were to wash your car and you were to put on, say, wax or ceramic coat on the surface and lightly spray some water on it, that water drop would look like that, pretty much, right? That would not be good. What we want is something that looks more like this. Where it has an angle that is measured here. Like that. And so this <coughs> angle right here should be less than less than 90 degrees. Well, that's so like lo lower viscosity. We're going to get into viscosity. Is that different than what That is mean? different. As opposed to this one, which they would be measured more like this. Which is greater than 90. This is bad. This is good. How do they measure that? What? How do they measure that? Just with a drop -o meter. <laughs> can't tell you're serious. <laughs> a widow meter? I'm serious. Big magnifying glass. No, what'd you say? Wetometer? Oh, wet atometer. <laughs> well, I'm gonna go get one then. Start doing that. Well, that's kept different one. All right. Can I check uh, where am I? Uh, how would he? Right there next to the flight line and the blinker fluid. Oh, I see what I did. Uh, unfortunately, what I do is I put the five, then I go into the five a little bit more in detail in a minute, so I'll just going to follow that. Uh, <clears throat> high surface tension. <clears throat> I used to think, <clears throat> when I first heard this, surface tension. That meant, like, if you had some sort of discontinuity, the surface <clears throat> tension would hold the fluid above it. And it wouldn't allow it to seep in. So I thought, no, you want low surface tension so it would flow. But surface tension uh, refers to, like, if you have a glass of something, glass of scotch, and I don't have brown here, and the, the fluid level, instead of being like this, it raises up at the edges. What is that called? Meniscus. Yeah, that's the stuff that comes out of your nose, isn't it? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's meniscus. <laughs> So that is, this is high surface tension. It tends to want to flow into cracks when it has a high surface tension. More about that in a minute. Uh, three, high surface tension, whatever. Uh, oh yeah, slow drying. If you let your penetrant dry on the part, you have failed. It does not dry on the part. This is not paint. So we do not want it to dry. We want a low viscosity. High viscosity would be like honey or maple syrup. Low viscosity would be like water. Penetrant. Penetrant. Like penetrant. <laughs> uh, ethanol. Of course. Uh, water was good. Uh, a high flash point. What is a flash point? Uh, when something ignites. Ignites, but doesn't continue to burn. <clears throat> Flashes. So we want the temperature that this happens to be relatively low. So the flash point would be the temperature at which the fluid has to be at before a spark can make it flash off. Then you get fire point, which means it continues to burn. So uh, for obvious reasons, we don't want it to be highly flammable. <clears throat> so circling back around to all these things, uh, we have the high wetting ability. Why do we use kerosene? Why do we use kerosene? Kerosene is a high flash point. Oh, this, this is uh, That's for this no, that's uh, uh, yeah, 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 sorry, sorry. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> for those of you thinking ahead, we use a kerosene in a uh, magnetic particle inspection. It's different. So high wetting ability, and this is uh, refers to the contact angle. <clears throat> of the drop of liquid. And that was what I showed you right up here. So less than 90, less than 90 degrees is what? Good. 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 
greater than 90 degrees is bad. We don't want the drops to sit on top of the surface. You know, going back to my analogy of you know, your car, if you put ceramic coat on it and you're washing the hood, it all beads up and doesn't hardly want to touch the surface. And like, wow, that's cool. Not cool for dive penetrant inspection. Uh, high surface tension. Uh, something I was curious about in regards to um, the biting ability. Can the uh, contact angle change depending on like if the surface of the object has a coating on it? You don't want a coating on it. I understand that, but can it change though? Uh, yeah, like if I ceramic coated the part before I put it in, I suppose it could. <laughs> I don't know, we could try that. I'll bring in some ceramic coat, we'll spray some, we'll dip it, we'll see what it does. <clears throat> Uh, okay, high surface tension. Uh, there are some factors of surface factors, factors of surface tension. And I know in some ways this is getting a little off into the weeds, but it's not if you actually go to um, this is the NDT training that is required of this subject. So you have to understand this. So factors of surface tension. We have cohesion. Um, which is molecules sticking together. I'm trying to abbreviate some of this stuff. And adhesion. <clears throat> the tendency of dissimilar particles or surfaces to cling to one another. So um, dissimilar. brings me to surface tension. This is actually an important point, believe it or not, even though it's a little uh, kind of deep in there, because it has to do with the way we deal with dwell time and the application of the penetrant inspection. And so it becomes actually quite important in the process and how you develop the process. So um, for surface tension, the, I'll read what I wrote. The cohesive forces between liquid molecules are responsible for the phenomenon known as surface tension. So cohesion between liquid forces, uh, see the molecules, I don't want to read all this. Let me just tell you what it is. Because um, I went through a long kind of roundabout way to explain what I want to explain. What I want to explain is this. When you deal with surface tension, there's this weird phenomenon whereby if we have a tank of liquid penetrant and we drop a part in the liquid penetrant and we leave it in the penetrant it affects the surface tension you have less surface tension while it's in the tank and so the fluid even though it's under pressure has less of a tendency to seep into the cracks so when you pull it the part out of the uh, the tank and you lay it down and the liquid is now covered on it but it's not immersed in it the surface tension increases, which tends to make that fluid flow into the crack at a much higher rate. So there's a formula for how long you can leave a part in the tank versus out of the tank, which we'll circle back around to. So what did I write here, all this stuff? The molecules at the surface do not have other mo like molecules on all sides of them. Let me see. So imagine a cup. Let's see if we can do this. So that's why we would just dip it in real quick and out. Mm -hmm. I have a little picture of a cup. Does that apply for every part, even complex shaped Should parts? Put that picture in here, and then I wouldn't have to draw it. Um, yes, I believe it does. So 
and I've got this cup and it's got a picture of all these molecules in it and then you've got the surface tension here kind of going up and that's called the what? Yes. All right, there we go. So the molecules at the surface do not have other like molecules on all sides of them and consequently they cohere more strongly to those directly associated with them on the surface. In other words, they start to work their way up. They don't have like molecules so it starts to go up. Um, the surface water molecules are also attracted to the side of the container, adhesion. This causes the water to climb up the side of the cup. The rising shape is called meniscus, therefore high surface tension, high adhesion, causes capillary action. I'm going to write that word down. Oh, I'm going to write it down in a minute anyway. Capillary action. That's my next point. Um, Capillary action is, is something that has to do with surface tension, you're mm -hmm. saying? Yeah. Capillary uh, action, the flow of liquid against gravity. So capillary action is the flow of, the flow of liquid against gravity. This will become more apparent point. We discussed leaving parts submerged in a tank versus letting it drain. Hey, I did that. All right, so capillary action, uh, the ability of a liquid to flow in narrow spaces without the assistance of and in opposition to external forces like gravity. So that's capillary action. What are some good examples of capillary action? <clears throat> I, I don't know if it's necessarily that, siphoning the fuel tank? No, because you're using gravity. Oh, uh, How about if I spill a little bit of liquid and then take a piece of paper and soak it up? Stick it like that. It'll soak right up. And the paper will start going up the paper. Capillary action, mm -hmm. right? Because it's going against gravity, going up. Mm -hmm. So the uh, ability, I was going to write something. Awesome. Capillary action is the ability of a liquid, of a liquid to flow in narrow spaces. Right here, narrow spaces. Yeah, yeah, I like that. Um, without the assistance of without the assistance of and in opposition to and in opposition to external forces. Gravity. Oh man, you lost me on some of those words. Liquid of flow in narrow spaces. With, what's the next one? Without assistance, Without assistance. of, comma. comma, and in opposition to, comma, external forces like gravity. So in other words, you get no gravity help. <clears throat> Example, oh yeah, I forgot about this one. So water, or liquid. Liquid. L-I-Q-U-I-D. Liquid flowing up paper. Uh, what about when you take a straw and you put a straw in some liquid? What level is the liquid in the straw? Just a little bit higher. Just a little bit higher. <coughs> that is called <coughs> capillary action. <coughs> I don't think it's quite as high as McDonald's straw. Those are like sewer pipes, right? The best straws, or they used to. I don't know. Uh, let's see. Penetrant must be slow drying because penetrant should not dry. Should not dry on the part. What happens if it does dry on the part? You know, I messed up. That's all. How long do you once it dries, it leaves a residue, which makes 
inspecting and working on it um, more difficult. More difficult. Okay. I'm not sure what's going to right here. Watch it, but yeah. Leaves a residue. Um, that hinders washing process. Uh, hard, it's hard to wash. It hinders the process. It's just not a good thing. And it must have low viscosity. I wrote way too much. Viscosity. The viscosity of a fluid is a measure of its resistance to gradual deformation by shear stress or tensile stress. For liquids, it corresponds to the informal concept of thickness. For example, honey has a much higher relative viscosity than water. Viscosity relates to the speed that pen this, to the speed that penetrant enters crack. So speed at which penetrant enters a crack or discontinuity, if you like. So all of these things are taken into consideration when you write a process. And the process is exactly what you're going to do. You're going to wash it, then you're going to put it in the tank for X number of minutes. And you're going to let it sit out here for X number of minutes. And you're going to dry it, and you're going to do this for X number of minutes. So it, all of this has to do with the process, the penetrant that's being used, because not all penetrants are the same, and what you're trying to accomplish. The sensitivity level, if you will. All right, so let's see. Liquid penetrant, where can it be used? On a, on a non part. Liquid penetrant can be used on any non porous material. <clears throat> so it's easier to say what you can't use it on. Can I use it on steel? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Plastic? Yeah. Ceramic? Yeah. yeah. As long as it's been baked, uh, I said plastic, uh, wood. No. Uh, no. Oh yeah, couldn't be doing on wood. So um, let's see, porous. Let's see. Uh, why can't I do it on something porous? So so good. Good. So good. If it is porous, um, part will absorb penetrant. Give false indications. Wow, man, this thing is tough. I can't use it at all. Yeah, like if you want to see if your sponge has a crack in it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, your wooden propeller, no good, man. Gotta throw that whole thing away. Yeah, so we'll just see some um, examples of porous material. Things we cannot use liquid penetrant inspection for. What do we have? Oh, wood. wood. Fabric. I said sponges. <clears throat> SpongeBob has a butt crack. We'll never know. <laughs> um, unfired ceramics. Why is that? Uh, Porous. Porous. <laughs> yeah, well, yes. The obvious answer. You just said it what there. about like roughly cast? Cast materials if it has a rough finish on it? Nope. Rough rough just makes your life a little more difficult, but there's ways around it. It's I would not use method C on it, you know what that means, because that's that's just gonna make your life miserable. But method A would be fine. Or even uh, the other two. So all right. B and D. <coughs> yep. That'll be what's left. So penetrant classifications. <laughs> We can define penetrant basically as two different types. Three if you really want to, but I don't. So, um, so penetrant, penetrant. Um, I said inspections, I should put liquid. We're just leaving penetrant, uh, can be divided into two types. <laughs> We're going to 
divided up into a lot of different types. First, we're going to start with two. So type one. <clears throat> type one. Which I like to think of as the first one you should use. That is fluorescent penetrant. It uses a fluorescent dye that fluorescizes under a black light. So fluorescent penetration, um, a dye that is visible. under a black light, ultraviolet light. You can see it without that, but not very well. As I think some of you experienced today, I said, did you wash that under black light? And you said, no. no. And I said, yeah, it looks like it. So it's bright green. And then there's type two. Type two, which uses a visible red dye. And you inspect under a bright white light. So first we're going to classify it by either type 1 or type 2. There is a type 3. Next. <coughs> I've never seen or used type 3, but I, have, I know that it's out there. It is both visible and fluorescent. And that's about all I know about that. I don't know its sensitivity. I don't know any other. I don't think it's a something that. It's the I told you so, so you can see it. And then Maybe, we're yeah. Look, look, <laughs> dumbass. All right, so first we're going to define it by type, type, fluorescent or non-fluorescent. Which one is better? Fluorescent. Fluorescent is better. We'll get into that. Then it is classified by removal method. Removable method. So we have method. A, which is water washable. And that is, uh, you can do type, that comes in type one and two, although I've never seen the type two water washable. We have method, take a guess. B. B, it is post emulsified lipophilic it's type one only what that means by post emulsified um, I should go like water washable it's kind of, it's a water washable Sorry about that. Let's be more specific. The method A stuff is an oil-based penetrant. And now I'm telling you you're gonna wash it off of what? Water. Water. Well, you ever like have a you know change of oil in your car and you have like a you know, those, dr those drain pans or something <coughs> and you get oil on it, you take it and try and wash it off? Yeah. How well does the water how well does the water wash off that oil? No, no. we're down the driveway into the in the gutter. The neighbors are yeah. see a rainbow. Right. And make rainbow. Rain. So we have an oil-based product that we just said is fully water washable. And it washes off very easy with water. How does that work? There's a thing called an emulsifier, which makes it emulsified, which means break it down. It, not like the wrap style, but break it down uh, with water. So the method A has an emulsifier built into it, even though it is uh, a oil base, water washes it away because it's got an emulsifier built into it. So uh, soap, would soap be considered an emulsifier then? Yeah, like Dawn. 
I guess we could say that. Maybe we'll find folks that don't disagree. I don't know. So, but don't wash ducks with this stuff. If that's what you're thinking. So, uh, okay. So, the method B, Bravo and Delta. Why they had to split them up? I don't know. Bravo and Delta must be emulsified after it's been in the tank. That's the term post emulsified. So you dip it into, and I'll go over this later too, but you dip the part into the uh, penetrant and then you let it sit because we have the dwell. Then it's going to go into an emulsifier and that is a very difficult process because the timing of that gets down into seconds. Uh, and I'll explain why, but it, it basically breaks down to a certain level and then you wash it off. Uh, and that's what that does. So uh, lipophilic uh, lipo is um, like liposuction, means like fat. fat. Yep. So that's Lipids. the term. Yeah. There you go. So that's uh, let's say lipo uh, oil based. Um, then we have method B. Or C. Method C, which we're going to put right in the middle between two that are similar, and that is going to be a solvent removable. So rather than water, now you need some sort of solvent. That's hydrophilic, right? No. No? This is solvent. See, right. solvent. R right. So it's just some sort of like, I don't know, gasoline, MEK, some, something that breaks down with the solvent. Acetone. Yes. It's not, though. It's its, a, it's own product. And type 1 and 2. We have type 1 and 2. Then we go method D. Method D. So we're back to pulse emulsified. So again, this is going to be like a water wash, post emulsified. But this one is hydrophilic, which the root word being hydro meaning water. Based. And you do have to remember those two names. Lipophilic goes with B and hydrophilic goes with D. And we get into that, and that's type 1 only. All right, so we have two types. <clears throat> type 1, one which two. is? Uh, fluorescent. The first one you go to, fluorescent. Then type 2, which would be the visible. Then we have the methods. A, B, C, D. A, B, and D are all washed off with? Water. 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 It's just that the B and the D you've got to add. Emulsifying. You've got to add the emulsifier. C, you solvent. solvent remove. Don't wash it. You remove it in a different way. All right. Then we have the developer. Now notice here A, B, C, and D are all caps. Method A, method B, method C, method D. <coughs> then we're going to use a developer. So the developer... <clears throat> is used to give a contrasting color first. It means a color that's easy to see. I don't know why they say a contrasting color because number one, I've never worked on a part that was blood red or day glow green. orange. Green, sorry, green. green. Yes, so I don't know why they say contrasting color, but that's what they want to say, so whoever they is. Uh, two, and this is, I think, more important, causes a blotting action. Maybe. Blotting or reverse capillary, if you like. Maybe the developer doesn't um, reflect under UV light, so it kind of gives it a dull look. That, <coughs> that was actually very, very true. The developer does, it's like a, there's several types of developer you're going to see, but they all tend to give a very uh, white um, matte finish to the part, which means that the light isn't bouncing back at you quite so bad, that matte finish, as opposed to a shiny piece of aluminum that is like a mirror. Uh, let me see. There are several different types, so several different types. of developer.
And I do have to add this, the form number varies by publication. So some publications have one thing, some have another, most of them have the same stuff. And it's called a form. So first thing is form, little a. Form A, that is a dry powder. Dry powder, it's like a talc powder or baby powder, if you will. And I just found out the other day, you know baby powder isn't really made from babies? <laughs> <laughs> so I've been wasting all my money on it? <laughs> You've been investing in babies for powder? <laughs> a talc, T-A-L-K, that's not right, T-A-L-C. <clears throat> that's talc. talc. What does it look like? Talc. Talc. There we go. A talc, um, a talc powder. Tends to stick to the wetness, right? Powder that sticks to the, that sticks. Um, it is applied to dry parts, which we're going to get into the process. But you put this on a part after it has been dried. Remember, we're washing it off with water. Gonna dry it first, we'll get into that. And it is the least sensitive. What does sensitive mean? What does it mean least sensitive? Uh, it's How it gets the biggest cracks. Least likely it picks up the, the, the penetrant. Least likely to cry if you if you beat it. Yeah. When we talk about sensitivity. We're talking about the ability of the penetrant or the system, when you add it all together, to pick up discontinuities. Sometimes you don't want an ultra-sensitive. Too much sensitivity gives you too many indications, and you miss the one that you're really looking for. Uh, if it's too sensitive, it goes into bolt holes, threads, studs, and then it just seeps out everywhere and gives gigantic blotches, and you can't tell if there was a crack anywhere in that area because it all bled out everywhere. So too sensitive is, is not good. Um, not sensitive enough is even worse because now you don't pick up anything. But dry powder is the one least likely to help you find an indication. Form B, is it water soluble? Water soluble, it is sprayed on wet parts. And very much like it is form C, which is water suspendable. The difference is water soluble is something that dissolves in water. And so you take a spray bottle and you put in some water and you put in your uh, form B developer shake it up, stir it, you're done. It's good, it's, it's all one thing. Um, but form C is water suspendable, which would be like particles that don't mix with water. And they mix, but they don't dissolve. So you have to constantly agitate it, and stir it and shake it every time you're using it. Um, that has pretty much, I believe, gone away from the industry. Everything's gotten more towards the water soluble if you're gonna do this, but it is also sprayed on wet parts. Is there a benefit to suspendable over soluble? Yeah. I don't think there is because when I went to order our stuff and I talked about ordering some water suspendable, the guy says, oh man, nobody uses that stuff anymore. I said, all right, that one either. Thank you for doing that. Form D, non-aqueous, which means what? It means it doesn't have water, non-aqueous. So it is a solvent-based. So our Form A dry powder can come in many different ways. Um, you could, like a, just a baby powder thing with a little holes in it, you know, fluff at it. I've seen some that have like a table with a lip on it and then there's all kinds of talc just in there and you just kind of blow it onto the part. Uh, we have a tank where you put it in and step on a pedal and it fogs up a little container and the fog kind of 
powder falls on it. Um, what else did I say? Now oh, you get the idea. Just kind of fluff it on there. Um, form B and C are both just spray bottles. They, you know, bought, I bought ours at the hardware store. Just spray bottles. Non-aqueous solvent base is going to be an aerosol can. Um, Non-aqueous solvent based. Um, let's see. Aerosol can. Aerosol can. <coughs> and then form, I'm going to go back up to this. Form E, non aqueous, solid based, aerosol can. And this is where some of the books kind of are, they're, they get weird. Some of them say this is for type 1, and some say this is for type 2. However, if you actually look at the Magnaflux Corporation product listings, you will see Form D and E are the same part number. <laughs> so... You can call it D, you can call it E, as you can go with D. Just go, ah, it's D, not aqueous, and I don't worry about the form E, because we're usually using type 1. But it's the exact same can, same product, same code, same everything. And then form F, which is a very weird one. They just call it special application. And in research and asking and trying to figure out what that is, best I could come up with, some say, well, it's like a plastic film. Well, how does it work? I don't know. So my takeaway from Form F is something other than the above. So what does that leave us with? A, B, C, a, B and D. B. C, C is really no longer used. A, B, D and E are the same. A, B, D, and nobody knows what F is. A, B, a, so we have A, B, B and D. D. So it's really what you left is just three different types. A, B, D, E, and D. In mystery. Yes. All right. Perfect timing for.